The word genocide is absurd. Genocide is what happened to the Jews uh, during the Holocaust. In other words, mass killing of a people um, by another people, uh, often for no good reason or no good reason at all, um, certainly not justified in any way. Um, Israel isn't carrying out genocide against the Arabs in the Gaza Strip or anywhere else. Um... Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 201. And this episode is with Benny Morris, who is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Middle East Studies at the Ben-Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. A few episodes back, so 190 with Richard Wolff, 191 with Victor Davis Hansen, and 192 with Norman Finkelstein, I decided to digress from philosophy and physics and some of the other topics that I'd been covering so that I could learn a bit more about the Israel-Palestine conflict. And not only did I learn quite a lot, but those episodes proved to be quite popular. So in light of those two facts, I've decided to do another three-parter with three new perspectives. And the first, obviously, is with Benny, who, if not the most respected and influential historian on Israel and Palestine, is certainly up there. And Benny is perhaps best known for his work on the 1947 to 1948 civil war in Palestine and the 1948 Arab-Israeli war, and for his book, The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, 1947 to 1948, a link to which is in the description. And as far as the landscape of views on these issues goes, Benny can be classified, or at least I will classify Benny, as pretty far on the pro-Israeli side of things, and this episode is particularly well-suited to be seen as in dialogue with episode 192 with Norman Finkelstein, who comes up explicitly in th this conversation, and Benny, I believe, comes up explicitly in, in that conversation. Though, for more thoughts and arguments on the pro Palestine side, you can tune in during the weeks to come. In this episode, though, we talk about the conflict from a resolutely historical perspective. We start pretty early on. Well, pretty early on would probably be in biblical times, which is not quite so early as we get. But we start with the establishment of Israel and the beginning of the refugee crisis and who is responsible for it, which, if you're not very familiar with these issues is an incredibly contentious issue. Uh, and then we get into the motivations and legitimacy of Zionism, of Israeli military tactics, whether genocide is occurring in Palestine, whether Israel is an apartheid state, and a whole lot more. So reviews, comments, likes, subscribes. All of these are extremely helpful and appreciated. There is also a Patreon if you would like to support the show or get show notes or get a link to an ad-free RSS feed. But now, without any further ado, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Ben. Before we get to current events, events put into motion in 1947 and 48 and b before then, I wanted to begin by asking about something I haven't heard much on in today's narratives and conversations, but that seems like it might be relevant to our discussion and it's also just very interesting. So historically, Jews have often been stereotyped as physically weak and brainy and effeminate. And this makes me wonder, because I, I read about it first in one of your books, and what was muscular Judaism and the new Jew movement? Okay. The, the word effeminate, I don't remember ever seeing, but certainly weak and, um, and uh, if you like, brainy, as you put it. That certainly was one of the stereotypes. <laughs> And when Zionism emerged in the 1880s, 1890s, and people began to move from Eastern Europe in small numbers uh, to Palestine, Zionists, um, 
one of their aims was to convert the Jew himself, to change the Jew, the nature of the Jew, certainly away from the stereotype and to make him muscular. Muscular being that he would eventually train as a soldier, that he would work the earth and grow things rather than be a middleman, um, to make it like a, make it turn him into a normal um, human being rather than some sort of um, side side sidelined uh, merchant and uh, as, as was said weakling or whatever who didn't defend himself. So that was one of the aims of Zionism, or at least a mainstream in Zionism. Mm. And so. <laughs> One of the major narratives over the past six months has been that the Israeli military and intelligence community was humiliated by the October 7th attack. That's something I know we don't have to talk about him in particular. I, I actually just saw that you had this big debate with Lex on Lex Friedman's show with Norman Finkelstein. But one of the things that he mentions was that this was this huge humiliation and upset for the military community. And I'm wondering if you see that at all as connecting to this legacy of muscular Judaism. I don't think it connects. I think it's per se. In other words, I think that the IDF was definitely, and the intelligence community, were definitely humiliated by both the surprise attack and by the IDF's terrible, weak response on the day itself and maybe even the day following. It took them a long time to get organized uh, for something which they should have been able to take care of in a few hours. Um, but they didn't. They simply didn't understand what was going on. And then somehow down the chains of command, uh, it didn't work for about a day until things started rolling. Uh, so definitely this was humiliation. And I would assume personally that some of the officers in charge felt personally humiliated, and maybe this is part, uh, uh, this also um, um, had an effect on their reaction to what happened. In other words, once they began the, the assault, first an air assault, and then the ground assault on Gaza, I'm sure this idea of wiping out the humiliation, at least in the subconscious, also played a part. Hmm. But there isn't any, you don't see any direct connection between the, between muscular Judaism and the new Jew. No, because and... the, the, the whole point of muscular Judaism, as, as I said, was in the 1880s, 1890s. I think okay. Israel's, um, the success of the Zionist uh, uh, venture or enterprise um, in settling the land and in uh, producing very good agriculture, much better, of course, than the Arabs. They didn't know how to work the land properly. They did, the Jews did. Uh, they turned the land into a land of milk and honey over the 20s, 30s, 40s. And the military successes in 48 and subsequently wiped out this idea of the non-muscular Jew. The problem now, if you like, at least in a um, uh, connection to the, the way Israel, the world is seen, that is the world sees Israel, is to tone down the idea of muscular Judaism. So that didn't come into a, a play, I don't think. But I think the idea of personal humiliation may have at least subconsciously entered into what happened subsequent to the 7th of October. Okay, okay, very interesting. Uh, and then the next thing that I, I wanted to touch on was the Nakba, which I, I often hear people reference, which is of I mean, tremendous significance to the conflict. But I think that before we speak about it and some of the controversy surrounding its interpretation, we ought to get clear about the actual events. So what are the the bullet points of the events in this period before we get into some of those debates around it and then the refugee crisis? Well, when, when the Arabs talk, talk about 48, especially the Palestinians, they call it the Nakba, the disaster in Arabic. And this was a major disaster for the Palestinians who were defeated in the 48th war, at least in the first part of the war, which was a civil war between the Palestinians and their militias and the, the Jewish um, inhabitants of uh, Palestine and their militias. Uh, 
the first five months of the 48 war were actually a civil war, and the Jewish militias headed by the Haganah a, defeated the Palestinian Arabs and basically collapsed their society. And then following that, the Arab states armies invaded Palestine on the 15th of May, 1948, and they too were ultimately defeated, at least if their desire was to um, uh, abort the emergence of a Jewish state and defeat the Jewish state, uh, which had been declared on the 14th of May, 1948, they were unsuccessful. Therefore, in fact, they were defeated. Even though, in fact, people don't really know this, but Israel actually defeated only the Egyptian army thoroughly. They didn't defeat the, the Jordanians. They didn't really defeat the Iraqi army, and they didn't really defeat the Syrian armies, all of whom invaded. Um, uh, there were partial defeats, but essentially these three armies uh, withstood Zionist or Israeli attack. Um, but the defeat of the Egyptian army basically collapsed the whole Arab alliance and forced them uh, to, to call for an armistice, which meant they were defeated. Mm -hmm. and so there was this, you said, I think, five-month civil war that began in, did that begin in 47? It begins in, on the 30th of November, 1947, okay. the day after the UN passed the partition resolution, which the Arab Arabs of Palestine and the Arab states rejected, and then began hostilities on the 30th of November. We know exactly because on that day, a, an Arab, a, Arab gunman attacked two Jewish buses, killed several of their passengers, and that began the, the, the snowball, uh, which turned into a full-scale full civil war, which ended on the, in May 1948 with the defeat of the Palestinian militias and the uh, Palestinian society. And then in 1948 is when, the, when all of Israel's neighbors uh, attacked Israel or invaded Israel after Israel's declaration of statehood. I would qualify that not all of its neighbors. Lebanon okay. didn't. Even Sorry. though the Lebanese radio claimed that they had attacked Israel, the Lebanese army, they hadn't actually crossed the border. They may have shelled, maybe with an artillery battle, a battalion, they may have shelled Israel, but they didn't actually invade Israel along with the other Arab armies, which did invade Israel. Okay. And then how does this play into the beginning of the Palestinian refugee crisis? Well, in the course of the war, uh, something like 700,000 Arabs, the Arabs claimed it was a million, uh, the Jews said the number was less than 700,000, but the true number probably was around 700,000. Several hundred, 700,000 Palestinian inhabitants of the area which became the state of Israel by the end of the war, by 1949, several hundred, 700,000 of these Palestinians were uprooted from their homes, ended up in refugee camps or in towns and villages in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip and in uh, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And that was the birth of the Palestinian refugee problem. Mm -hmm. And then how would you characterize what the debates over this are? What are the main issues that well, I mean, the, 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 the main issue, well, there's an issue about the numbers. As I say, the Arabs uh, um, exaggerated the numbers, in my view. The Jews at the time uh, belittled the numbers. They talked about 500,000 refugees. But actually, um, as I say, United Nations um, uh, experts checked the numbers. Uh, and by 1949 50, they worked out that something like 700,000 had be, been. Um, um, uh, uprooted and turned into refugees and recognized by the United Nations as refugees. Um, the main um, uh, controversy about the refugee problem is what caused it. And the, the, the Jews essentially said at the time, the State of Israel, after it's declared on the uh, statehood on the 15th of May, 48, said that the, the Arabs were responsible for it. They were responsible for it on, on large by beginning a war which ended up with the uprooting of these Palestinian refugees. And this is clear. They began the war, both the Palestinian Arabs, the first stage, and the Arabs' uh, armies which invaded in the second stage, 
they began the war in its two stages. And that resulted in a refugee problem. So uh, in that sense, they are responsible. Um, but the Jews also claimed that Arab leaders had uh, invited or ordered the Palestinians to leave in order to clear the potential battlefields from innocent Palestinians. They would move aside. They wouldn't be hit. They wouldn't be caught in the crossfire. And they would come back um, to their homes and lands on the backs of the invading victorious Arab armies. That was the Israeli claim that it was the Arab leaders who told them to do this. And this is non uh, basically nonsense. There were places where Arab local leaders and Arab military commanders ordered or advised villagers or at least children and women to leave villages. But on large, there was no call by the Arab states or by the Palestinian national leaders to the Palestinian Arabs to depart their homes. This is just a propaganda invented by Israeli officials at the time, because in certain places, like in Haifa, um, the local Arab notables did tell their people to leave. But this was in one particular case. It didn't apply to the most of the country. The Arabs claimed that, um, and this was also nonsense, that the Jews um, had, with predetermination in line with a planning a, and policy, had expelled the 700,000 from their homes. And um, a, myself, having investigated this over years, a, looking at the documentation and so on, I see that that's not correct. There was no master plan. There was no systematic expulsion. Most of the Arabs simply fled in face of encroaching battle. Um, a unit comes to a village, wants to capture it. It shells the village lightly. The Israelis didn't have much artillery. Um, they used mortars. Um, uh, and the Palestinians uh, fled the village. And then later, the Israelis did not allow the villagers or the townspeople to return. That's the expulsive part of what happened. But there was no um, a general uh, order or plan or policy uh, to expel the Arabs systematically. And a good proof of this, incidentally, is that about 20% of Israel's population at the end of the 48 war was Arab. Arabs, 20% of Israel's citizens at the end of the war were Arabs, given Israeli ID cards, Israeli citizenship, and so on. And had there been a master plan and a, a consistent a policy of expulsion, I don't think these 20% would have remained. And Israel, incidentally, today, in, with its 9 million or so population, 21% or 22% of its population is Arabs, Arab citizens of the state of Israel. And about 78% or 77% are Jews. And all of this is because there was no master plan or consistent policy of expulsion in 48, in my view. Okay, there's there's so much interesting there to talk about. First, something of a, a meta question. I mean, you said that after the war of 48, there was a lot of, and maybe even getting closer to the present, there's been a lot of debate over the numbers of the Palestinians who were expelled on the low end, uh, 500,000, but it settled on- so the Palestinians- who uh, were, Sorry. Uprooted, were uprooted. uprooted. That's the phrase I would I would use the phrase driven out. The Palestinians were on large driven out. This is what really happened. But most of them fled from battle and weren't allowed back. A small number were expelled. And okay. a small number were urged out by their own people. But the, the number was uh, settled around 700,000. And this is just a problem that I have had as I've been doing research on these topics for this for these conversations too, is that different historians, and it seems like this is particularly uh, problematic for the Israel-Palestine conflict, just because of how emotionally charged it is and how invested the historians are often on one side or the other. But different authors will cite very different numbers and very different figures to back up their claims. So I can imagine even if 
700,000 is the agreed upon number. There are some very ardent Zionist historians who might just, as an example, cite the 500,000 number or pro-Palestinian historians who will cite the million, like a million number. Uh, and it's just very varying. And I'm wondering how, as a non-historian, well, you're an historian, obviously, but how, as a non-historian, as I am, or, or many of our listeners, you would recommend that we go about reading and learning about these situations when the historians themselves are citing such different figures. And it's very difficult to know who is right and who is wrong and who is being genuine yeah. when you're not, you haven't done the research yourself. I, I wouldn't see the historians citing different numbers. I would say, by and large, historians agree more or less on the 700, 750,000 Arabs and Israelis today agree on this. Uh, but propagandists, journalists, uh, um, non scholars do talk about still perhaps in Israel five or six hundred thousand, and on the Arab side, as I say, nine hundred thousand or a million. But this isn't really a debate among scholars. I'm saying scholars can move between seven hundred and seven fifty thousand. I think Arabs would more or less agree to that. Two other figures, the five hundred thousand and the million, basically are propagandistic. The Israeli trying to, Israelis trying to, uh, Israeli government and spokesman trying to lower the figure, which would mean Israel was less responsible for the uh, what happened. Uh, and, and Arabs saying it was a million, so the Israelis are even more evil than um, um, presented if the numbers are lower. That, that seems to be the argument, but it's a propaganda argument, not really a, an argument among scholars. Among scholars, there are real arguments about the causes of the creation of the Palestinian refugee problem. That's a real debate among uh, experts as well. So I was just using that number as one example. I, I didn't have any particular cases in mind, but one example of this phenomenon where I do have particular cases in mind is whether is the state of the land prior to the Zionist movement uh, of Palestine, how occupied it was, how flourishing it was, uh, how many people were there. I guess that's what how occupied it was means. But for instance, in one of your books, you cite uh, Mark Twain's passage from his visit to yeah. Palestine, where it comes off as this very destitute, uh, marshy, uncultivated land, whereas on the other side, I've encountered descriptions of it as just being this, this very densely inhabited, lush, cultivated landscape. And again, you have t multiple groups citing different, different sources and different numbers, and it's very hard to adjudicate between the two as a non-expert. Yeah, th this is true. The Zionists claimed in the uh, first half of the 20th century that the Turks who had ruled the country until 1917 and the Arabs who lived in the country they had left it basically desolate. They hadn't cultivated properly. Um, and along came the Zionist settlers and made the desert bloom. That was the, the uh, so in other words, that showed that the Zionists really cared about the place, whereas the, the Arabs and the Turks certainly they were uh, non caring and non productive. That, that's the that's the, the propagandist image. Um, the Arabs countered this with saying, no, there were lots of Arabs living there. They cultivated lots of land, and the Jews simply drove them out and inherited a very well um, uh, preserved and uh, very um, succumbed uh, agriculture. Uh, that, that's the way the Arabs present it. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. What is true is, and this is what's often forgotten, Half the country, half of Palestine, uh, with its mandate, British mandate borders, uh, was wasteland, was the Negev Desert. So basically, we're talking about a popular, populated area, which is north of Beersheba, from Beersheba, north of Beersheba to the Lebanese frontier. That's the area w which was properly inhabited. And it's true, some of it was marshland, 
especially in the coastal area. Um, and it's true that some of the hilly area wasn't that arable. Um, but there were people living there. We know the numbers. The, here there's no argument about the numbers of people living there. And you tell me if it was densely populated or not. There were 450,000 Arabs living in the country in 1881 before the Zionist settlers began to arrive from Eastern Europe. 450,000 Arabs and something like 20, 30,000 Jews living in Palestine, all of them concentrated in that area north of Ber from north of Beersheba to the Lebanese border. Today, that area from north of Beersheba to the Lebanese border probably contains something like six, seven, eight million people. So does the 450,000 mean that the place was empty? Well, it, they didn't feel it was empty, but people who are like Mark Twain who came along and saw that it wasn't like New York or uh, Amsterdam, it wasn't really crowded. Um, but on that end, it wasn't empty. Well, uh, uh, and this is this is it's taking a subjective us... thing. That's what I'm saying. It's subjective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is taking us a bit far afield from the Nakba, but I just want to keep in mind that I would like to get back to this 1948 period and, and the beginning of the refugee crisis. But while we're talking about this, the relative least sparse sparse population of of the area in this time is often cited as one of the justifications for the establishment of Israel and the Zionist movement. And I'm wondering if you find that compelling or just the way that you looked, it seems like you think I might have missed it. I've never heard it cited as a justification. What the Zionists said was the land isn't fully inhabited so there is room for more people. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not just a forgiving. That's not really a justification of Zionism. Zionism had other right. species of justification. But they said, well, there's a lot of empty land here. Why can't we also live here alongside Arabs? That was the Zionist argument of the time. But let me add something else here. We are talking about uh, the creation of the Palestinian refugee problem in 48. One must remember there were two, re three refugee problems created by the 1948 war. The one which we talk about all the time, the Arab refugee problem, we talk about because it still exists. And the numbers, of course, have a, a grown geometrically because the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of the refugees from 48 are recognized by the international community, meaning the United Nations, as refugees, which is, of course, unique in the, the history of the world that later generations also get uh, the the um, benefits and the, the title or identity of refugees. This has happened there, but that refugee problem exists, and therefore we talk about the refugee, the Palestinian refugee problem. Two other refugee problems were created by the forty-eight war. Seventy thousand Jews were uprooted from their homes in the course of the war. Now you may think seventy thousand is not many. It's a small number as compared to 700,000 Palestinians, but 70,000 represented more than 10% of the Jewish population of Palestine in 1948. There were 650,000 Jews in Palestine. That's what we're talking about, in fighting 1.3 million Palestinians and tens of millions of Arabs. Those 70,000 who were uprooted from their homes represented over 10% of the Jewish population of Palestine at the time. If America, for instance, was invaded or whatever, and you had 10% of Americans becoming refugees, you would have 35 million American refugees. So 70,000 for the Jews in 1948 while fighting a war for existence was a considerable refugee problem. That refugee problem vanished by the end of the war because Israel recaptured the sites from, the, from where these refugees had emerged. In other words, Jewish settlements which had been taken or abandoned um, uh, uh, under Arab attack um, were resettled by these people. And the Jewish refugee problem in Palestine vanished by the end of the war, no longer exists after 49. The third refugee problem which um, uh, the war engendered was the refugeedom of the Jewish communities who had lived for hundreds and even thousands of years in the Arab states. These were all basically pushed out 
in the course of the years 1948, 1964. And we're talking about seven to 800,000 Jews who had lived in Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, Syria, in, in, in Yemen, Iraq. All of these Jews essentially left the Arab world in, in, under social pressure and under serious governmental pressure, which actually was oppression, um, beginning with the Jews of Yemen, the Jews of Iraq, um, all of them left uh, these countries in vast numbers. Most of them ended up in Israel, became citizens of Israel, um, and uh, their refugeedom ended. And some of them ended up in England and France. What this means is those seven or 800,000 Jews were essentially pushed out from the Arab world, uh, which be, by societies which identified these Jews with the Zionist project, and therefore they regarded them as potential enemies, if not actual enemies. Um, they no longer exist uh, as refugees. They no, no longer remain refugees, uh, unlike the Palestinian refugees who weren't properly absorbed, didn't return to their homes, and uh, the Palestinian refugee problem remains to this day. Yeah, it is interesting these two non-Palestinian refugee problems, which sound if if you quoted uh, like seventy thousand and eight hundred thousand, they outnumber the Palestinian refugees. But they're one. This is not discussed ever, and then two, their refugee status is not hereditary in the way. Well, they're not there because they stopped being refugees. So they, they couldn't pass it down to generations. It's worth pointing out, though, to um, something else. The Palestinian refugees, unlike the Jewish refugees from Arab lands, want to return to their homes and lands in Palestine, which became Israel. The Jewish refugees from the Arab states do not want to go back to the dictatorships and failed societies, which are the Arab world today. Hmm. Well, then that's maybe a good reason not to be talking about it as much. Yes, they no longer exist as refugees. Right. Well, some not... Israelis, but some Israelis, of, for, for instance, of Moroccan origin, do go back to, to visit where they, their families came from. Um, they like Moroccan food and so on. Most, of course, the, of the refugees from Iraq, from Egypt, well, not Egypt, Iraq, uh, Syria, and so on, can't go back and have a look in, as tourists from where, from where they came. Uh, the countries don't allow these uh, Israelis of uh, Syrian or uh, you know Iraqi origin to go back there, but um, the Moroccan Jews do often go to Morocco and visit the place that is descendants of those Moroccan Jews uh, to see what it was like. In returning to the the question of how populated Palestine was, I guess I I shouldn't have put it the way I did, where I said that this was. Um, a justification of Zionism. It wasn't a justification of Zionism. It was a facilitation of the Zionist agenda. If Palestine was not well populated, then it could support the Zionist movement. But this then raises the question, I mean, what does motivate Zionism and what does motivate the uh, the continued establishment of Israel as a state. And I'm wondering, so one that comes to mind naturally is there is a religious element. There has been a religious element that this land is divinely ordained and, and meant for the Jews. Then there is the historical and genealogical development because Jews can cite their historical claims to this land and that they populated it for a significant period of time. And then, of course, there's the Holocaust and the anti-Semitism that Jews experienced outside of Israel for hundreds of years, thousands of years prior to uh, 1948. And I'm wondering how you weigh these three uh, motivations for Zionism and justifications of the Israeli state, uh, both historically as a motivation for Zionism and then today? 
Okay. Um, Jews over the 2,000 years in which they were in exile, in other words, the first, basically the first and second millenniums AD, um, in some way, in prayers, um, in, in their thoughts, in their psyche, talked about returning to their origins, which was the land of Israel. The land of Israel, which is uh, named uh, among uh, Christians and remains today the main name of the, the area, uh, Palestine, um, was the land inhabited by the Jews between 1200 uh, BC and uh, the first, uh, second centuries AD. In other words, for the 13, 1400 years, was um, mostly inhabited by Jews and ruled periodically during these 1400 years by uh, Jewish um, uh, sovereigns, uh, uh, kings, and, and whatever. Um, uh, Romans came along, uh, conquered the land, the Jews rebelled against the Romans, eventually um, expelling some of the population, others drifted off, uh, others were converted to Islam when the Muslims conquered the land in the 7th century, uh, but most Jews were in the diaspora by the middle or the certainly towards the end of the first millennium, and as I say, thought about returning to the land, um, uh, at least in their prayers and in their minds, and regaining Jewish sovereignty. Um, so that was a sort of a religious historical uh, motivation for Zionism. To this was added in the 19th century, the growth of nationalism in Europe, where the Jews were mostly concentrated. Um, uh, Czech, Czechs wanted independence, Pal uh, Pol Poles wanted independence, Slovaks, uh, Serbians, they all wanted independence and uh, produced ideolo uh, nationalist ideologies and um, um, uh, nationalist movements. Uh, desiring sovereignty in their own land, not to be occupied by the Russians or the Austro-Hungarians or the Germans. Yeah? Um, uh, this affected the Jews who lived in these countries um, in two ways. The, the nationalism of the various peoples in Eastern and Central Europe affected them in the sense of um, uh, copying. In other words, uh, if these Serbs and these Czechs and these a Poles want independence and to be sovereigns over their own land. Why shouldn't we Jews also want to be sovereigns uh, in in our own land? Uh, um, and this is what uh, Zionism preached: uh, returning to the country of our origin, where Judaism was born, where the Jewish people, in effect, were born, and regaining sovereignty there. This was one part of it. The other part is that uh, nationalism in Eastern Europe and Central Europe also had a very xenophobic character. Uh, Serbs didn't like, uh, I don't know, didn't like uh, Slovenes and Czechs didn't like uh, um, uh, Germans and uh, Poles didn't like Russians or Germans. Uh, there was a lot of xenophobia there. And among the people they didn't like were the Jews. In other words, the nationalism of the 19th century bred a lot of anti-Semitism hatred of the Jews, and eventually also pogroms and killing of Jews. This was especially true in the Tsarist Empire, in the area ruled by Russia in Eastern Europe. And there, their Zionism began with a desire, as I say, because of the historic ties and some religious connection, um, Zionism began there. People began thinking about returning to Zion and there reestablishing a state, also to flee from these anti-Semitic Gentiles among whom they lived. And this, of course, uh, culminated in the Holocaust in which Germany uh, and its uh, helpers, who accru included a lot of Eastern Europeans, Ukrainians and Poles and Romanians, but also Western Europeans in France and uh, Holland and so on, um, uh, this brought to a head and, if you like, gave full justification for the aspiration of the Zionists um, to establish a state of their own where they would be safe and uh, secure uh, from anti-Semitic um, murderers, basically. And these were the, the motivations of Zionism at the end of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. And how do you answer, I mean, with this in mind, 
the continued, I mean, current calls for the disestablishment of Israel as unjustified and not legitimate? Well, the first thing I would say is there are 7 million plus Jews living in Israel today. And if you're calling for Israel's disestablishment, which would mean by fire and the storm, by um, conquest and by possible annihilation by atomic weapons, if Iran ever gets them and wants to use them, um, what you're preaching, if you want to disestablish Israel, is a mass slaughter of 7 million Jews, or at least a large number of them. And mm -hmm. is this what you really preach? All these um, young students who are ignorant of the facts, in my view, of um, uh, the, the history of the conflict um, uh, are preaching when they say uh, they want Palestine from the river to the sea. And what are you going to do with 7 million Jews? You're going to kill them all? You support the murder of 7 million Jews or the expulsion of 7 million Jews? Would this be justified? Um, um, they're not thinking. They're not thinking about these things. And they should be thinking about this as well. If you support the Hamas, which wants to destroy Israel, and basically get rid of all of its Jews by killing or by expulsion. Is this really what you want? That, that's one thing. But the other argument, I think, uh, the, the, the positive argument, this is a negative argument, why you shouldn't be calling for Israel's destruction. But the, the positive argument, why should Jews not have a state of their own? The Arabs have 24 or is it 25 states from the Atlantic Ocean to the Persian Gulf. Why should the Arabs have 25 states and the Jews have no state at all? Is this fair? Is this, is this justice? Um, uh, so the, the Arabs will say, well, it's not us Arabs, it's the Palestinians. When it's convenient for Arabs, they talk about uh, all of the Arab nation, one big Arab nation. When it's convenient, they talk about a separate Palestinian Arabs uh, people or nation. Uh, but the, the truth is the Arabs do have 24, 25 states. And the Jews offered the Palestinians a, a number of times, 1937, 1947, 2000, 2008, a two-state solution. In other words, a compromise based on the establishment of two states, a dividing Palestine into two states. And the Arabs have consistently rejected it. But Hamas never talks about two states at all. It just wants to destroy the Jewish state and kill the Jewish people there. Um, the Fatah supposedly says it's willing to have a two-state solution, but when it comes down to it, whenever it's offered to them, they basically say no. So in effect, they basically don't want a two-state solution. They, like the Hamas, also want all of Palestine just for the Arabs. Um, I don't see that that's fair. And um, I think the Jews have a good case saying that they have lived there for many, many years. The Arabs came along and conquered the place in the 7th century. If the right of conquest uh, gives, if conquest gives you the right to own the land, then why Jewish conquest is not as viable as Arab conquest as a justification. Jews came and conquered it in 1948. It's just as justified as the Arabs conquering the place in the 7th century as a basis for a claim. Um, but as I say, the Jews did live there for many, many years. The Arabs, incidentally, up to the 19th century, often called the land the Jews' land. They uh, uh, accepted that this belonged to the Jews, but they argued, well, but now it's full of Arabs, so there's no room for the Jews. That was the argument. Not that it didn't belong to the Jews. Maybe it does belong to the Jews, but we're here now, so you can't come along and um, uh, take it or take some of it or whatever. The Jews say we should have a land also, either for our own security and because we have historic rights to it. Speaking of these 20-something Arab states, in the area, do you are you familiar with the name Douglas Murray? I've heard the name, yeah. I've I think I've seen it on YouTube or somewhere, yeah. Yeah. So there is a, a recent clip earlier this week, and I think this will come out Sunday, so it'll be topical. Okay. That that went viral in which he was talking with an Al Jazeera journalist, and he pointed out that. Gaza is not only bordered by Israel, but by Egypt. And yeah. this is something that I never hear mentioned in the media really ever. And I'm wondering, so I recently had <clears throat> Norman Finkelstein on the show and, and we spoke and he 
at length characterized Gaza as a concentration camp and the Israelis as Nazis sort of guarding the concentration camp. And I am wondering how you think that, well, one, just whether or not this is a reasonable analogy, but how the fact that Gaza is also bordered by Egypt, I mean, should affect the way that we view Gaza and the situation. Uh, look, the Ga Gaza ruled by the Hamas officially since uh, 2007 has been under a type of siege by Israel, uh, at least the three sides, the, the Mediterranean side in the west, in the north, along the uh, 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 the territory itself and in the east uh, has been under siege by Israel because Gaza was a staging post under the Hamas for rockets, uh, 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 rocketing attacks against Israel's um, villages and uh, even towns um, over those 15 years. In fact, the, the rocketing began even before 2007, uh, from when the Hamas took the took over the place. Um, but but um, uh, it was under siege because Israel said we can't allow free passage from Gaza into Israel because um, uh, it will involve terrorists crossing the border and killing Israelis, as happened, in fact, on October 7th. And we can't allow it to get uh, all the materials they need, metals and, and uh, gunpowder and God knows what, uh, because they'll use it to make rockets to attack Israel. Um, so there was a siege there. And as, as you pointed out, it's also bordered Gaza on the south by Egypt, the Egyptian border. And the Egyptians themselves also maintained a strict control of the border, not allowing people from Gaza to move into Egypt or from Egypt into Gaza. And the same applies to material, material, material various material. Um, so um, they may be, the Egyptians may be imposed a siege on Gaza from their side of the border for no, re no reason other than simply not wanting Palestinians to infiltrate into Egypt, not because Palestinians were busy rocketing Egypt, but the Israelis had a very good reason to keep the place under control. While keeping under control, they also supplied Gaza with um, a water, with um, electricity and fuel and so on. In other words, it was sort of a very strange type of siege in which Israel both keeps people uh, from entering and leaving the place, but at the same time supplies it with the means with which it can actually exist and live. Um, and I think the people in Gaza didn't have that bad a life inside Gaza itself during these years of siege, even though they complain as Palestinians always complain because they're always busy pushing their grievances rather than some of the good things which actually happened to them as well. Uh, but but um, 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 that was the situation in Gaza, which, as you say, was controlled along its borders by both Israel and Egypt, and that was the situation. The comparison by people like Finkelstein to a Nazi concentration camp is, of course, a absurd and a ludicrous. Um, um, if you don't rocket your neighbors, you're not under siege. If you do rocket your neighbors, you can expect various uh, um, restrictions on your movement and uh, in the supplies which reach you. This is, uh, I mean, I don't want this to be t too much about uh, Fingelstein, but I have heard... I think, it's, well, I think it's wasting time to waste time on Finkelstein. Yeah, so we don't, ha we don't have to talk about him more in particular, but he is one person among others who I have seen sort of disparage what you've called the the rocket attacks and say that they're really nothing more than like children launching <laughs> sort of like if tiny lived, if homemade in, rockets. If you, lived, if you lived in one of the Israeli settlements along the border or even in some more distant places, which were occasionally attacked by rockets, you wouldn't think that's a, a, such a, child, a child's play. Um, uh, when you live in fear of actual rocketing and you have to run to your shelter when you've got about 10 seconds warning to run to your shelter. And some, some of the people running to their shelters broke their legs along the way. Um, uh, rocketing is very, very frightening. You don't know when it's coming and when it comes, 
you have very little time to escape the rocket. And sometimes, occasionally, it will kill somebody. Most often, it won't. But that is what terrorism is about. They lived under a reign of terror along Israel's border, the Jewish uh, settlements, the Jewish villages uh, and towns, uh, because they were under constant rocket, threat of rocketing. The, the townspeople and villagers there, the Israelis, constantly complained to the Israeli government, do something about it, do something about Gaza. And uh, there were occasional uh, uh, campaigns or uh, attacks or retaliatory attacks on the Hamas in Gaza. They were never done uh, properly, never done fully, never done efficiently. And the, uh, the Hamas continued the rocketing. Um, people like Finkelstein, who live perhaps in New York or somewhere, don't know what a rocketing attack is like. People who live in Beiri and the Nachalos know what a rocketing attack is, and it's a real problem. Not to mention, of course, a massive uh, assault by gunmen uh, who are busy uh, raping your women and murdering you and taking 250 civilians hostage. Um, uh, not 250 civilians, about 200 civilians, maybe 50 soldiers hostage. Um, um, you'll have a slightly different uh, idea, perspective. If you're not living in New York, I think this does raise though some some more very interesting meta or philosophical questions. In the case of science with scientists, it is, I mean, it's not always the case, but it's generally somewhat easy to tell the pseudoscientists from the scientists. Uh, you can tell somebody who's citing astrology or who has fanciful claims about ufos it's it's not it's pretty clearly not uh scientific but in the case of history you can have somebody uh or there are people who have phds in history who publish academic works that have been vetted by academic presses but it seems that many of these people you would still label as propagandists rather than historians and scholars. So I'm wondering how you distinguish the two, because from the outside, it does seem convenient that you can label somebody who cites different figures from you just a propagandist, even if they have similar credentials. Well, unlike people who are not historians, um, historians are supposed to know the texts and use them, the documents essentially, on which uh, historical reconstruction is founded. And um, 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 when you look at the, the texts by people like Finkelstein or Ilan Pape or others, you see such distortions of the material, uh, such misinterpretation of things which are clear and obvious in the documents uh, that you don't necessarily take them as serious historians. And this is what happens. Now, it's true that most people who are not historians can't differentiate. As you say, those guys cite things, these guys cite things. Who's right? How do you know? Well, maybe not everybody can know, but people who are serious historians and know the materials and can go back and look in the archives at the, the citations and at the original documents can see whether somebody's busy distorting it for propagandistic purposes. And this, unfortunately, I see in various um, um, so-called historians who uh, preach the Arab side, people like Rashid Khalidi or people like Ilan Pape. Um, distortions of uh, the, the, the actual, what is actually said in the material, mistranslations of things. This is a um, legion in their work. Mm -hmm. So Rashid Khalidi and Ilan Pape are two of the big names that I have uh, been instructed, suggested to interview on the more Al Arab Palestinian side. And I'm wondering if, I think this will just be interesting for our listeners in general, if there are any historians who you view as uh, very legitimate, good historians who do take the opposite position to yours. Well, I'll put it this way. Firstly, to begin with, um, Arab historiography in general is constricted by the fact that um, the Arab states are all dictatorships and they mm. put in jail people who say things they don't like and sometimes kill them 
and Arab societies live under these dictatorships and thinks, think in these terms that uh, one should not be self-critical, that um, self-criticism shows that you're helping the enemy and that uh, you are not really a, a loyal citizen of your own country. And this applies to Palestinian so-called historians and historians. In other words, Palestinians are oh, Palestinians such as Rashid Khalidi, who are um, aware of the possible danger to themselves um, if they write too critically about their own side, um, uh, restrict themselves and and um, uh, delimit their um, self criticism or criticism of their side. And uh, the same applies to um, uh, publishing facts which uh, would put them in a bad light. Um, Palestinian historians who live in Palestine uh, also have, have to fear being actually stabbed in the back, literally, by somebody who doesn't like what they're writing. People like Rashid Khalidi, who live in America, perhaps, have to worry about maybe they'll come and visit Israel, maybe their families live in East Jerusalem, and themselves could be targeted if they step too much out of line. So um, there is a reason for why the Palestinians don't break ranks, Palestinian intellectuals. This is part of the reason. The other part is they don't have a state, and they haven't succeeded in their struggle for independence and statehood. Uh, and they feel that if they um, write critically about their own side and give ammunition, so-called, to the other side, uh, they will do, be doing a disservice to their uh, aspirations for statehood um, and uh, freedom, uh, as they would put it. Um, whereas Jewish historians or Israeli historians have a state, uh, they're not uh, targeted uh, by um, uh, people who don't like what they write, uh, they won't be killed, uh, they might be denied uh, promotions, they might be denied um, uh, grants, um, uh, but, but they, or jobs in fact, but, but they, they won't be physically in danger or their families physically in danger if they write things critical of the Israeli side. So there is a asymmetry between the historiography of both sides, partly generated by the situation of the historians on each side. Living in a dem democracy is, um, enables you to write a history a properly a, and self-critically, and that's why there are Israelis like Ilan Pape a, or myself who've been critical of the Israeli side and the history of the Israeli side. And why on the Arab side you won't find this? No breaking of ranks. Hmm. No, that's, that's very interesting uh, that it's kind of these really s systemic broader issues that, from your perspective, constrain the Palestinian and Arab historians and prevent their giving a legitimate reading of the history. Something that you often hear from the Israeli side is that the attacks or bombings in Palestine are often preceded by text messages or pamphlets that are dropped to warn the civilians that there are going to be these attacks on Hamas strongholds. But then from the Palestinian side, you hear that this never happens and that they always oh, come no, no, a, without warning. This is a lie. Uh, in various Israeli operations, um, counterattacks against Hamas over the, the decades, Israel has uh, often warned Palestinian civilians living in the Gaza Strip, your house is going to be targeted, your house, in other words, a big apartment block, is going to be targeted because you have Hamas uh, officials or officers or gunmen uh, hiding in this apartment or that apartment. We're going to attack it in the coming hour. Please leave. And what Israel uh, call, calls knocking on the door, uh, Israel even used small missiles which didn't contain um, explosives, sometimes onto the building itself to tell the people if they didn't actually use a phone to call them up, which also happened. They knocked on the door with these um, uh, non-lethal missiles to tell them to leave because we're about to actually attack with lethal weapons this apartment block, and this happened often. And it happened as well during this uh, um, uh, Israeli counteroffensive following the, the massacre by the Hamas 
of Israelis on the 7th of uh, October. Uh, it's possible that it's been used less in this uh, uh, campaign for the past five months than it was in previous uh, campaigns. But Arabs know very well that this was a normal uh, and unusual conduct by the Israeli Air Force, unlike any Air Force in the world, which actually never warned anybody anywhere that they're about to attack a certain site. I wanted to finish with uh, just asking about two topics that are, or two allegations against Israel that are often levied. The first is Listen, that... I'm not, a gov- I'm not a government spokesman, so I'm not here to withstand or respond to allegations. I can respond to some if they happen to be correct, but uh, what you're asking me is what I understand, um, and I'll answer what I understand to be the facts of the case. Whether yes. it works in Israel's favor or not is another matter. Yes, yes. So the first is that Israel is engaged in ethnic cleansing and genocide of the Palestinians. The word genocide is absurd. Um, genocide is what happened to the Armenians in Turkey um, uh, over three bouts, in fact, at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Genocide is what happened to the Jews uh, during the Holocaust. In other words, mass killing of a people um, by another people, uh, often for no good reason or no good reason at all, um, certainly not justified in any way. Um, um, Israel isn't carrying out genocide against the Arabs in the Gaza Strip or anywhere else. Um, there have been uh, thousands of deaths of uh, Arabs in the Gaza Strip during the Israeli counteroffensive, which was a response, as I said, to a Hamas, uh, a savage Hamas attack on Israel. Um, but uh, the numbers, probably the numbers um, broadcast by the Hamas are inflated. The Hamas often lies about, what, uh, about everything, and the health ministry there is controlled by the Hamas. So I wouldn't believe their number of 32,000 um, Gazans killed uh, in the uh, Israeli campaign over the past five, six months. But thousands certainly have died, many of them Hamas uh, fighters. Uh, they, uh, the Hamas never announces how many of its fighters have died. The Israeli army claims it's killed over 12,000 Hamas fighters. Um, but this is certainly not genocide. Genocide is when you try to kill a people. Um, if Israel was out to kill um, uh, the Palestinians, uh, Israel has the weaponry and the capabilities of killing hundreds of thousands in a couple of days or a couple of weeks or a couple of thou- a couple of months. This hasn't happened. Uh, I think Israeli, um, the Israeli army by and large has tried to avoid killing civilians in the Gaza Strip in this campaign. Uh, but unfortunately, the Hamas hides behind and among civilians and getting at them often involves um, uh, the death of the uh, collaterally of civilians. Uh, this is unfortunate. This is terrible. This is tragic. But uh, the Hamas are to blame for this, for having initiated this cycle of violence by attacking Israel and for hiding behind and under and between uh, civilians. And then the, the last thing that I wanted to ask is there is this, again, allegation that Israel is an apartheid state and an apartheid government. And I'm wondering how you think about this one. Okay, I think this is nonsense also uh, when it applies to Israel in its pre-1949 borders. In other words, uh, Israel, before conquering the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in 1967, Israel is not an apartheid state and its regime is not an apartheid regime. Israel's Arab citizens, as I said, 21% of Israel's population have full rights. They vote. They have members of parliament. They uh, have a, a chief justice. In, in Israel's Supreme Court, uh, they have judges, they have rights, uh, right of movement, right of employment. All of these things did not exist in a, a apartheid South Africa, where uh, there were two classes of citizens, some with rights and some totally without rights. Uh, in Israel, it's completely different. There may be discrimination against Arabs. Israel, uh, the discrimination against minorities occurs in most countries, democracies included, um, but the state, in terms of the law, in terms of officialdom, um, is run uh, on an equal basis vis-a-vis uh, Jews and uh, Arabs. Arabs don't serve in the army. On the other hand, they don't get certain loans from the government. 
uh, there's a sort of a trade-off of rights and duties and so on. Um, but there is something akin to apartheid in the governance by Israel in the West Bank, the occupied West Bank. There, there, there is a, a different system of justice which applies, a different laws which apply to the Arabs who live there and the Jewish uh, settlers who live in the territory. And I've always been opposed to the Jewish settler enterprise in the West Bank. Um, there are even some roads where only Jews can travel or only Arabs can travel along. Um, and, and this is a form of apartheid, not based on race, but based on national conflict. There is a national discrimination, um, if you like, akin to apartheid in the West Bank. But this does not apply to the regime in Israel or Israel proper, in my view. Okay, Benny. Well, thank you. This has been such a, a treat to get to talk to you. I look forward to doing it again sometime in the future. My pleasure.